Well, good afternoon, and thanks again for being with us today. Today, I want to update you on next steps under our executive orders dealing with businesses and public gatherings, as well as new help for workers who need child care. All of this starts with data. As you saw in Monday's modeling data, social distancing is working. We saw that in the model UVA released on Monday and in other national models. The actions that we have taken as a state are having an effect. They are slowing the spread and flattening the curve. We are still seeing new cases, of course, and unfortunately, too many deaths. But in large part, these are still cases that were contracted weeks ago. So when people say that it's time to stop what we're doing and get back to normal, they're wrong. Right now, the models and our hospitals expect that we'll be able to handle the expected surge in patients. But if we let off the brakes and try to go back to the way things were, we'll see another spike in cases that could overwhelm our hospitals. You saw that as well in Monday's data. That's why today I'm extending Executive Order 53 for two more weeks. I issued that order on March the 24th. It's the order that closed recreation and entertainment businesses as well as personal care services. It also banned gatherings of more than 10 people. It is set to expire next week. Now it will expire on May the 8th. We will continue to monitor health data in the meantime to determine what needs to happen after that. It's important to remember that the stay-at-home order remains in effect until June the 10th. I know that everyone is looking forward for a path forward. I am talking regularly with our neighbors in Maryland, the District of Columbia, and North Carolina. We want to move forward in a coordinated way. We all want what is best for the health and safety of our people. I know this has been a frustrating time for all of us. People are out of work. Businesses are closed. Our entire sense of normal life is out the window. People want to go out. They want to work or to see their friends and families. They want to know when they can regain control of their lives as they once knew them. And everyone needs to remember that a lot of people are working overtime, taking care of patients, are stocking grocery shelves. They're stressed. They feel like their health is at risk, and they want to protect their families. I hear you. We are all in this together. I want everyone to know these sacrifices that you have made have been necessary, and they are helping. They are slowing the spread. They are giving us time to plan and prepare. We need to be clear. Things are not going back exactly like they were before. Together, we will figure out how to build a new normal. Right now, that new normal will probably look like covering your face, spending more time at home, teleworking if you can, continuing to use social distancing and to stay away from large gatherings. We all will continue to weigh what we want versus what we need. We will figure out how to continue taking steps to protect ourselves and people who are most vulnerable, those that are elderly and those that have previous health conditions. Then we can move to easing the restrictions. As Dr. Fauci has said, there is not a switch that we can flip. The way forward will be deliberate and it will be careful. But we will move forward and we will do this together. Our business community will be a part of this conversation. They have been so helpful working with our economic strike force and looking 
at creative ways to make sure that when we do ease restrictions, consumers like you will be able to feel safe and comfortable returning to businesses. Remember, Virginia started off strong before this virus, and we will continue to be strong moving forward. This is a great state in which to do business, and new laws make this an even better place to work. Prior to COVID-19, our economy was literally on fire. Our March general fund revenues were 10.8% higher than last year. Think of that, 10.8% higher this March than they were a year ago. But that has changed, unfortunately, and we must work together to rebound. Now let's turn to another way we are helping our essential workers. The closure of our K through 12 schools affects some 1.2 million Virginia children under age 12. With social distancing requirements, many child care centers have closed their doors. But child care remains vital, especially for essential workers, hospital staff, law enforcement, sanitation workers, postal workers, UPS and delivery drivers, grocery workers, corrections officers, and many others who are still working to keep our society moving forward. Today, I'm pleased to announce that $70 million from the CARES Act will go to support these essential workers with children under age 12 and the hardworking early childhood educators. This money will allow us to do the following things. We will provide direct, flexible cash assistance to the centers that have remained open. We will prepare schools to act as emergency child care centers where needed. We will eliminate co-payments until June for families who are already receiving federal child care subsidy dollars. And we will make additional funding available to centers that accept federal subsidy dollars but had had to close. We want to be sure that centers that serve our most vulnerable Virginians are ready to welcome children back when it is possible to do so. These measures should help some of our child care centers stay open to serve the children of our essential workers. My wife, Pam, a former teacher and pediatric occupational therapist, has dedicated the past two years to advocating for Virginia's early childhood system. She has additional information to share for our providers and families. Because of her team's efforts, we were on target to ensure that all at-risk three and four-year-olds had access to early childhood education in our Commonwealth. And then COVID-19 arrived. But I want to reassure you that as we recover, Early childhood education will continue to be a top priority of ours. So, Pam, to you and your staff, uh, I thank you so much for all of your work uh, for our children, and welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. As the governor said, over the past two years, I've traveled over 5,000 miles visiting early childhood educators and families across the Commonwealth to highlight the critical importance of those first few years of life. It has been abundantly clear that the most important part of Virginia's early learning system is our talented superhero educators. And these past few weeks have made that more evident than ever. I know these are challenging and unprecedented times, which is why we fought so hard to get this additional 70 million to you as quickly as possible. Providers, please visit childcareva.com for more information on these new resources. We also ask that all providers share their most up-to-date hours and availability with Child Care Aware of Virginia at 866-KIDS-TLC or virginiachildcare.org. Parents, you are a child's first and most important teacher. You know your children best. And we know you are courageously and tirelessly working to support and reassure your children during this time, even when you may be feeling overwhelmed yourself. We thank you for the sacrifices you are making 
to keep your family and your community safe. If you need child care because you have to work, whether as a health care worker, first responder, or in other in essential industries such as food and grocery, sanitation and cleaning, transportation, utilities, or government, please know that we are so grateful to you and invite you to also visit Child Care Aware at vachildcare.org or call 1-866-KIDS-TLC for an up-to-date list of where you can get quality child care in your area. Thank you for everything you do to give us hope each day. The Commonwealth is strong, our children are resilient, and together we will get through this. Together we will continue to work to lead the nation in early childhood care and education, the cornerstone to building a better, brighter future for our young people and our nation. Thank you so much. While we are focused on the COVID outbreak, we also cannot forget that tomorrow, April the 16th, is the anniversary of the tragic mass shooting at Virginia Tech in 2007. I have ordered all flags across the state to be lowered to half staff in memory of the 32 people who were killed that day. Our thoughts are always with their families and loved ones. Now I'll ask our health commissioner, Dr. Norm Oliver, to give you a health update, and then we'll be glad to take your questions. Dr. Oliver, welcome. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. The numbers today for um, the impact of this uh, pandemic here in the Commonwealth, we now have a total number of cases of 6,500. That's 329 new cases in the last 24-hour period. The deaths now total 195. That's an increase of 41. Uh, just a word on that, that's a big jump from the last time um, it was reported. And I think it's important to understand that disease surveillance, including uh, death surveillance, is not done in real time. It involves several steps, and at each of those steps, human beings are involved. We don't know about someone's death in the moment that it happens. In small outbreaks, that means that we can catch up pretty quickly. In the situation of a pandemic, it takes longer time, and that gets reflected in this lag in numbers and in periodic jumps in those numbers in our uh, dashboard. Uh, the health department has an obligation to ensure that you get high quality, accurate data in as timely a fashion as, it's, as is possible. But it's important that we vet that data and make sure that it's really high quality and accurate. So I, we would like to thank you all for your patience and your support as we carry out this important work. And also thank you for communicating uh, this information to the public. The data that we have on the racial and ethnic uh, categories and um, the cases and deaths uh, continues to have problems with uh, some missing data. Of the um, <clears throat> 6,500 cases, uh, we only have 3,904 that have the data on race and ethnicity. Uh, given that, the uh, 1,158 cases of uh, COVID-19 among African Americans means that that population in our state has 30% uh, of uh, the cases. In terms of um, uh, deaths, with 59 deaths among African Americans and with the race and ethnicity data available on 168 of our total of 195, that means 35% of the deaths are African American. Thank you. We'll be glad to take your questions. Yeah. To, um, this morning, the outbreak at Canterbury Rehab was declared by the New York Times to be the worst at a long-term care facility in the U.S. Given that um, and what we know now, could the state have done anything differently to respond or direct resources to that facility? 
I think the the state has has really stepped up and and done everything possible. Uh, uh, as I have said, Kate, uh, uh, these are the, nur the nursing homes uh, where our elderly or most vulnerable patients are are, are a real challenge. Uh, they are at risk uh, because of their age. As I've said, a, a lot of them are non-ambulatory. Uh, a lot of them don't communicate um, normally. And so uh, to, to have an outbreak uh, at a, a nursing home uh, when that virus is introduced uh, in that type of environment um, is, a, is a challenge, and uh, we're doing everything that we can, uh, and I think uh, the response was, was totally appropriate. We continue to have challenges with uh, our PPE. Uh, we are uh, directing uh, that to go toward our nursing homes so they don't have a shortage. We continue to have financial issues. As you know, we have made some changes in our budget uh, to increase the rate uh, that nursing homes get reimbursed per Medicaid patient. Um, and we also continue to have a, a challenge with, with staffing. Um, and we, through the, the volunteer corps, uh, we are training individuals and allowing them to, to help with the staffing at our nursing homes. And, and finally, Kate, uh, just uh, the, the uh, challenge of testing. Um, remember when we started this process, uh, the turnaround time, uh, especially for some of our commercial labs, uh, was five to seven to sometimes nine days. And so that in of itself, uh, presents a tremendous challenge. But, um, you know, Dr. Forlano is overseeing that process, and, and we're doing everything that we can to support our nursing homes, knowing uh, that that's where some of our most vulnerable uh, individuals in Virginia are. Hi, yes. Um, I was wondering about the, you mentioned the volunteers again, Governor. Um, where does the 30,000 number that got put out this morning for the volunteers needed come from? And then also, if those people are out there and they're needed, why not just hire them to do these jobs rather than ask for volunteers? The question, uh, Marissa, did, did he say, I, I didn't hear the initial number. 30,000 30, that are needed. Uh, Dan, do you want to comment on the, the need for? Yeah. For staffing. Yeah. Thanks. Sure thing. Um, be glad to, Governor. Um, the number 30,000 was really taking into account uh, the duration of this and that these are volunteers and that uh, they would not be indefinite staff. So spending a, a week at a facility, uh, including working through the details of, of helping out in the long-term care environment, was where that, that number came to be. So that was the number. We'd rather have more people available and registered. Uh, rather than few. And I'll just give the example of my wife, Kim, is a, a registered nurse, and she is in a clinical research um, position, that was, for, and she was furloughed. So yesterday she has volunteered in the Richmond Health District and was assigned, and they're taking them on a, a weekly basis. Now, she is working more on reporting results uh, than in other environments, but she is an example of folks that were now we know who they are, they've had basic uh, training, we know what their skill sets are, and we are in a position to de deploy them as needed. So um, that's where that very large number, we wanted to take advantage of all of the, the trained medical personnel, whether they're nurses or, or physicians or respiratory therapists that aren't in full-time positions on the front line now, that could be tapped. So that's where that number came from, and, and there's an example of, of how they're being used and how we're uh, we're moving through Dr. Falano's uh, efforts uh, to make them available uh, in long-term care settings and other uh, settings in addition to acute care hospitals. Thank you, Governor, we're, um, in addition to Canterbury, we're also following the, the situation at uh, Beth Shalom yes. uh, and in Rico. What can you tell us about that and what the task force may be doing to help make sure that doesn't become as bad as Canterbury? So, great question. Um, and if it's okay, I'm going to let Dr. Forlano uh, address that. Dr. Forlano, thank you. Hi, the question was about a facility in Henrico. Uh, so I don't have specific details on that particular facility today, but I can speak generally about uh, the task force. So the task force, the way I think I would describe it is that this, this body is bringing together a lot of subject matter experts, providers, 
uh, leaders here in state government to develop a more systems level approach so we can strategically respond to all of these outbreaks, not just uh, ones, you know, that um, pop up here and there. Uh, we're, I think the governor spoke really eloquently about many of the components that we're focusing on, staffing, testing, PPE, uh, coordination between the hospital setting and the nursing facility settings. So all of those things are um, being developed in partnership. Megan Healy is helping us with uh, workforce issues. So I'd say what's been described is the approach we're taking. Uh, yes, I just don't, uh, I don't have details, so I don't want to misspeak. Thanks. Hello, Governor. I wanted to see if you or Dr. Oliver could spend more time addressing the 41 new deaths reported since Tuesday. I know Dr. Oliver spoke of the lag time in reporting and sometimes a large uptick can be deceiving, but I wonder if you can address the number of deaths. It seems like that is the biggest one-day jump since this hit Virginia. Um, and I'm wondering if you can give us an overview on whether the 41 deaths, how many of those people had underlying health conditions, um, and how many, uh, what, what areas of the state those people were from. Um, so the question, as I understand it, is uh, to explain um, in more detail the jump in, in the number of deaths, particularly the uh, uh, this most recent number of 41. Uh, and um, I, I, I think the thing that I explained earlier is the most important aspect uh, toward understanding this. This is this is a, a correction in a, in a um, data reporting. Um, on our dashboard and doesn't mean that that many deaths occurred in that 24-hour uh, uh, period. Uh, some of, many of those deaths were in fact uh, from uh, a prior time and what was happening was that uh, information was finally being entered, uh, for example, into the database or death certificates arrived and then that was entered into the database. So that's why we had that um, big jump. Um, for that particular number, and that may occur uh, from time to time. I, I, as I mentioned, there's many steps in the process here. Uh, the people who are doing the case uh, investigations and the contact tracing of those cases are the same people who are doing the data entry. And while they're busily tracing and tracking down hundreds and hundreds of contacts of cases, there may be a lapse of a few days in which they haven't sat down at the computer to do uh, data entry. And when they do, um, the numbers will increase. But that represents prior uh, history, not necessarily what happened that day. Thank you. And, and I think a part of the, the question was, did, did these individuals have pre-existing conditions and, and what were those? And without getting into the specifics, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, individuals that reside in our uh, nursing homes and, and chronic care facilities, uh, most of them are, are elderly. Uh, a lot of them are non-ambulatory. They, they don't walk. Uh, a lot of them are unable to communicate. Uh, and obviously, in that age group, a lot of individuals have underlying medical conditions such as heart disease, lung disease, uh, things like asthma, uh, renal disease, uh, and, and diabetes. And, and we know that all of these pre-existing conditions put these individuals, uh, in addition to their age, uh, at risk. So it's a, a, a very vulnerable population. What we're seeing from the UVA peak and that, you know, potentially happening in late August. Mm. So, you know, with this stay-at-home order currently extent being until June 10th, um, are you sitting here today currently considering extending that based on that new peak? And if you're not going to extend it, can you speak more specifically to what life might look like after that June 10th deadline? Um, will we completely go back to normal or are we going to continue to see restrictions into the summer of any kind? Yes, yeah, so the, the question is, as far as the UVA data and our stay-at-home order, um, I don't have any intentions uh, as of today uh, extending that. Um, as I've said all along, uh, the best news would be uh, to continue the social distancing to see our, our curb 
flatten uh, and then start decreasing and, and even to be able to move that June 10th date back. But as I've said each day uh, here, this is such a dynamic situation. It is fluid. It, it literally changes every day. The, the data that are, are being put into these models uh, changes. And so, so we make our decisions really on a day-to-day -day basis. So, so for me to sit here or stand here uh, two months, uh, almost two months before June the 10th and say what we're going to do at that time uh, is really difficult to say. And I know that's frustrating. I, I, I love data and I, I love to be exact and I, I want to be able to give Virginians uh, exact answers. But uh, I would just uh, ask all of you and, and our viewers to, to be patient and, and again, uh, these things change day to day. I will tell you that, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, a lot of, uh, a lot of our energy right now uh, is being focused on, on how we help our economy uh, recover uh, from, from where we are today. And uh, again, I, I thank the businesses out there that are really being creative, being innovative. And, and this recovery uh, is not so much a, a government-driven uh, recovery. It's going to be a, a business and consumer-driven recovery. In other words, when will our consumers, when will you and I uh, be comfortable going into the places of business. And so, so our businesses are really working with our strike force group uh, to, to really make those determinations and, and come up with a plan. And I think uh, part of your question, are we just going to go back at one, on one day to being normal again? Uh, I don't think that's going to happen uh, in the near future. And, and the reason that it's not going to happen, uh, we have a novel virus, as you know. Uh, uh, we're learning more about it every day. We don't have a vaccination. Uh, we don't have a, a, a treatment for it. Uh, and so until, until we have a vaccination and, and we can say that, well, the virus is gone and are not necessarily gone, but everybody now is, is safe and they're not going to contract the virus, um, then it's, it's difficult to say we're going to go back to a, a totally normal uh, uh, life. So, so as we move forward, things like wearing the mask, the, the social distancing, uh, all of these things will continue, I really think, as, as part of uh, the way our society uh, uh, acts on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. My question is regarding testing. The Johns Hopkins COVID-19 dashboard shows Virginia has the second lowest rate of testing in the nation after California, yet Virginia is the 18th highest rate in or the 18th highest state in confirmed cases. So are our testing criteria too rigid, or do we have fewer tests than other states, or how else do you account for the relatively low rate of testing? And could more, help, could more testing help slow the rate of community transmission? Yeah. Sure, thank you, Governor. The question was that uh, looking at the, the criteria, we have uh, tested, what, 44,000 uh, Virginians, but uh, the Johns Hopkins uh, data that per 100,000 or, or some metric uh, that normalizes for population that we are um, amongst the, the, the lowest. And um, that's, uh, that's something we're, we're addressing. We are trying to understand uh, how do we optimize the capacity we have, whether it's in the state lab or academic labs, as well as in commercial labs. Um, also, we've been in touch with our, our provider community. Um, what I've learned is that many of our uh, providers who, uh, unless uh, it's going to influence where folks are cared for, namely in the hospital, often they think that they can, and rightly, care for patients with COVID-19 on a, on a practical basis with presuming that they have it. But from an epidemiological point of view, there's many advantages to have more people tested. So I think that we need to, as the state, through our developing a task force, which will have more uh, be able to report out in the, in the days ahead, is, is looking at that capacity, how to, how to synchronize that with the, the criteria that we use. Right now, we've got um, across the state, excuse me, across the nation, there's three categories from the CDC. There's, there's the group one, the group two, and, and group three. And we have been focusing on those that are hospitalized uh, and those that have healthcare workers with symptoms. We've expanded that to include, and this is work from the health department together with the state lab, focus on those uh, within the, uh, the long-term care facilities. And that's where we focused additional testing capacity to make sure that when there was an outbreak, whether it was coming from the state lab or from UVA uh, or from the VC lab or other uh, academic labs around the state, that that capacity was there. What we are evaluating now is how to make sure that 
as that we broaden that testing criteria uh, with our clinical community so that we can have more testing and a better sense of, of where this is happening. And there's, there's two real goals. One is outbreak uh, intervention that uh, Dr. Falano has discussed. The second is how our providers, that's the, the nurse practitioners, our doctors, the, the PAs that are caring for patients one at a time, and then also our public health surveillance to make sure that we have the right capacity for those different missions. And clearly we need more, more testing available here in Virginia. So I think we're, we, we certainly understand that data and we know that it needs to be improved. And I've outlined uh, how we're gonna go about improving it. So thank you. Some of those owners of the barbershops and salons have asked if you could make any special consideration. They said that they could work by appointment, also maybe have one or two people in their shops at a time, spaced out, so they won't watch their life's work with down the drain. Secondly, mm -hmm. um, you've always talked about this virus being a, having no respect for person. Mm -hmm. Uh, some people are wondering if you are reaching out to your Republican counterparts to help come up with solutions. Are they involved? Are you talking to them? And if so, who are they and what are they suggesting? Yes. The, our, the question, two questions, and I'll, I'll address the second one first. Or, or am, I, am I talking to my Republican counterparts? And yes, I, my door is open, my phone line is open, uh, internet, uh, whatever. And I. I hear, not from all Republicans, but certainly a lot of them uh, that I have worked with in both the, the House and the Senate uh, over the years. And, and as I've said all along, I, I appreciate everybody's input. So, so I listen to that, and then obviously we make de decisions uh, based on, on what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis. I think your first question is, is really a, a good question as well. And his, his first question was regarding barbershops. And uh, this is uh, one of the the questions and, and comments that I hear most frequently because uh, for a couple reasons, I suspect. One, uh, people's hair continues to grow and they're wondering uh, where and, and uh, when they can get a haircut. And probably uh, even more importantly, uh, these are businesses and these are people that, that need to be working. And so when I talked earlier about uh, the input from the business community. Uh, we've had a, a number of, of barbers and, and owners of uh, salons uh, that have given suggestions on, on how we can do this safely. And, and so uh, while we expanded the stay-at-home order, the, the, not the stay-at-home order, but the, the gatherings of, of less than 10 and, and the, the businesses, the entertainment business, recreational businesses, as we move forward and plan, uh, as far as how to start opening up these businesses, barbershops is, is going to be at the top of my list. I can promise you that. But, but we're not there quite yet. Uh, but I think there are ways that we can do it safely uh, by uh, making sure that we wear masks, making sure that we continue the social distancing, not having more than 10 people in a, in a, a place of business, et cetera. So, so we're working on that. We're discussing it on a day-to-day -day basis. And so for those individuals that, that are in need of a haircut, uh, and uh, more importantly, the, the barbers, uh, it's at the top of my priority list. Thank you for the question. I have two part one for the governor. Have you made any consideration to extending the filing or payment deadline for taxes this being April 15th? And for Secretary Moran, who I think I saw over there, wondering if you might address the letter sent by several of the uh, Commonwealth's attorneys asking for the uh, release of incarcerated youth among, among the uh, pandemic. The first question was about extension of uh, filing deadlines for our taxes. So uh, as, as you all know, uh, the, uh, the normal date actually for federal taxes is today, April 15th. Uh, I don't have any control over that, obviously, uh, but that has been e e extended for three months to July 15th. Regarding Virginia's taxes, our taxes are due on May the 1st, and we have extended that to June the 1st. Uh, I think Secretary Lane or Secretary of Finance has, has already kind of uh, explained uh, why that is. We're on different cycles at the state level than we are uh, at the national level. Uh, the other uh, reason for not being able to extend it past uh, June the 1st is that um, our cycle, our budget cycle ends uh, on June the 30th. Um, we need to continue to keep our essential 
um, services open. Um, and unlike, I, I think uh, you all know this as well, unlike uh, the national level, uh, we can't print money here in Virginia. Um, and so we need to balance our budget. And so uh, those guidelines extending the state uh, taxes to for a month and the federal taxes for three months will, will stay in place. And your second question is for... The question having uh, with respect to a letter sent by uh, a handful of prosecutors regarding our juvenile justice population, and happy to, happy to respond to that letter and, and, and their inquiries. Uh, you know, juvenile justice transformation has been one of the real success, successes of this administration and the preceding administration. We have reduced the population from 600 to 200. Um, residents. We have closed the Beaumont facility. We now only have one uh, residential facility uh, con uh, operated by the state at Bonaire. And so a great deal has been done with respect to placing these uh, uh, young people in the community so that they can obtain community services and reintegrate into uh, their, uh, their community. So uh, what is left, though, are some of the kids that frankly need some of the most intensive services. These are young people who have been traumatized either physically or mentally or both emotionally, and they require a great deal of services, services that can be provided at the Bonaire facility. Now, despite all that, we are working um, uh, diligently. Uh, Director Boykin and, Boykins and her team are reviewing each and every one of those 200 kids. Uh, some of their based on determinate sentences, and I suspect those prosecutors know what that means. Uh, that means the judge has given a sentence uh, that uh, is required to be served. Uh, then there are about 70 percent of the kids there are determinate. The other 30 percent uh, are indeterminate, and those kids the juvenile Department of Juvenile Justice has more discretion over. Each and every one of them are being reviewed to see if uh, there is a plan for success to send them back into the community or uh, some community-based uh, placement. And so, uh, yes, reviewed it. Yes, very well in informed with respect to what DJJ is doing with those kids. And, uh, you know, Director Boykins and her team have just been, I mean, uh, they work with these kids very, very closely and will do what is in their best interest. David McGee with the Bristol Herald Courier. This, thank you, Governor. I wanted to ask, as you deliberate trying to get Virginia back toward normal, how much will you consider the actions of neighboring states so that businesses in border areas aren't adversely affected? It's an excellent question. The, the question is, as we uh, get back to our new normal, if you will, how much will we be working with our neighboring states uh, so that there is consistency. And um, we have a really good relationship. And back to your question about reaching out to uh, Republicans, uh, Governor Hogan from the state of Maryland, who's the chair of our uh, National Governors Association. I, I work closely with him. And as you know, our vice president and president are Republicans. So we're in communication with them uh, as well. But as far as our neighbors, Governor Hogan uh, in Maryland, Mayor Bowser in D.C., and uh, then Governor Roy Cooper in North Carolina. Um, either myself or my staff uh, is in daily communication uh, with, with their staff or the governors and, and mayor on a daily basis. And uh, we have tried to work together and I think done a good job with that to be consistent. And, and I think all of us agree that as we move forward and, and return to our, our new normal, the, the closer we can be, the more consistent we can be um, the, the better. And I'll just give you a, a quick example. Uh, if we were to open restaurants, for example, uh, in Virginia a week before they do in Maryland, uh, the only thing that separates us is the Potomac River. And so that would be inconsistent and it would be confusing for people. So, so as we move forward and, and reopen our businesses and, and get back into that new normal uh, mode, we'll, we'll work as closely as we can with our, with our neighbors. with the Roanoke Times. 
Um, yes, the physicians, I understand, are now reporting clinical diagnosis of COVID cases to the health department. Uh, when will these cases um, show up on the VDH dashboard, and what are they telling you so far about the spread of the disease that the testing hasn't captured? I didn't even catch the first part of the question. I'm going to let Dr. Oliver answer, but could you start your question over again, please? Actually, uh, yes, can you hear me? I'm having a really hard time hearing you. Uh, so we understand that physicians are now also reporting clinical diagnosis of COVID uh, without um, test confirmation of the disease to the health department. Um, so we wanted to know when these cases will be reported um, publicly on the VDH dashboard and what um, the number of these cases that are being reported to the health department are telling you so far about the spread of the disease that testing so far hasn't captured. Um, I will let uh, Dr. Forlano, who, uh, in addition to being our Deputy Commissioner for Population Health, uh, prior to that was our state epidemiologist. So uh, I think she'll have um, some expertise here. Hi, thanks. The question is about clinical diagnoses. So those are diagnoses that doctors and other healthcare providers can make in absence of a lab test. So we are trying to, uh, we have encouraged providers to report clinical diagnoses through our uh, electronic portal online. So we're collecting that information. Uh, my understand, I'll have to verify this, but my understanding is that uh, a national case definition for those, what we would otherwise call um, a suspect, uh, case has not been established, but if it has been, uh, there is some time that it takes to go through all those reports. Uh, I don't have a clear uh, date as to when that would show up on our dashboard. It would be important that we uh, would collect that data and then vet it against a case definition so we're sure to count everything the same way. Uh, so I'll talk to the staff and um, can be happy to get that information to you at a later time. Uh, thank you. The question is that if, if you look at the numbers that result, we get them when they're resulted and reported to Virginia Department of Health, not when they're ordered or when they're actually collected. So there is there is a lag time. But the question was that if you, you, you look at the incremental daily, that it was 1,500 from yesterday, today, and probably 2,000 the, the previous day, where there are some days last week there are 3,000 or 2,500. So a little bit on the higher than this week. And, and the answer is I think that... Uh, we're testing, you know, there's about 1,300 individuals in the hospitals in Virginia, and that's where we've been focusing the effort of getting them diagnosed with a, a, a relatively rapid test, whether at the state lab or at one of the newer labs, UVA, uh, VCU, uh, Centera, um, and now at, uh, at, uh, uh, at Carillion, that they have in-house testing. So that's where the focus was initially, because you, you were burning PPE and, and you needed to know whether whether they, they truly had the dis disease, because it would influence the care that they received. So, um, so the, the number of tests that have been ordered, I don't think has grown. We, we are definitely focusing on the, the, the long-term care, but I, I think it, it really reflects, I can't say from a systematic survey of all providers in Virginia, but of a sample that, that we've had contact with is, is that when tests were really hard to get, um, practitioners went forward with clinical diagnoses and the like for folks who are at low risk and would do well at home. Now that we have more testing capacity, we need to adjust our criteria as well as our instruction and recommendations to providers to take advantage of that increased capacity. So I think that's, that's what we're working on and that's, that's what we have to share today. Thank you. Give us back data, so tell us this is a death that happened on this day, 
And then even though we're seeing the spikes per day, we can kind of ship our own internal data and tell people this is what the graph ideally should look like and this is the true number per day of people who died of COVID-19. Um, so if I understand your cor uh, question correctly, you want to know, it, would it be possible for VDH to give um, data about the date of death so that uh, it would be possible to backtrack and um, be able to discern that lag? Um, the, um, the, the, the health department is giving lots of data around uh, COVID-19 and many other diseases by age, gender, race. Um, we're one of the few states um, that actually give that race and ethnicity uh, data. And we will continue to figure out ways to improve uh, that. Uh, within that context, though, it's important to understand that by uh, Virginia code, we are required to protect the uh, anonymity of the people that we conduct surveillance of. And there are certain things uh, like um, date of death, for example, that might um, make it possible to identify uh, a night, um, an individual in certain circumstances. So we haven't, uh, as a general rule, released uh, date of death as part of that data. Um, we've been releasing it in terms of um, uh, district, and we'll continue to do that, um, but we haven't done date. are now making so many clinical diagnoses given the absence of tests. I mean, can you speak at all to how much weight people should be putting in the daily numbers reported on the VDH dashboard that only report lab-confirmed cases? I mean, if there's widespread clinical diagnoses coming on, what number of cases do we actually have? Hi, thanks, Kate, for the question. So the question is about the data that we report versus um, the data uh, uh, that may be a true perfection of reality of what's going on there. So I think what's really important to understand about disease surveillance is that uh, it's not intended to count every single solitary case public health surveillance, especially with, unless it's an unusually rare condition. So, uh, for example, Ebola in the United States, it's pretty easy to count one case because there's only, you know, one case every 20 years or hopefully never again. Um, with something like influenza or a viral illness like coronavirus, the goal is to establish a trend. The goal is to establish an understanding of what populations are being impacted by the disease. And we can do that with, uh, with the data we get. We always aim to count as many as we can. But that does take time to, to receive the reports. And as something with a new condition, uh, it takes even more time. So I have confidence in the data that we have received. I have confidence in what we are reporting, and I have confidence in the trend that it's illustrating, understanding the limitations that we can only display the data that we get. So I hope in time we'll be able to reflect a little bit more on some of the clinical diagnoses that we're getting per previous question. And our weekly reports uh, that are published every Monday are getting more and more detailed with time as the numbers go up. So you'll be able to have an appreciation of uh, racial and ethnic data, a little bit more granular with hospitalizations, et cetera. So I think in time you'll see more detail. But uh, public health surveillance, uh, the key word in epidemiology is trend. So um, I, I hope, uh, I, I think that what we're giving is, is as good as, you know, as good as we can get right now. Thanks. Just in closing, again, thanks to all of you for being with us today. And um, as we return to our, our new normal, uh, I would just uh, encourage and, and uh, remind you that things will be different as we move forward. We will continue, I think, to put a lot of emphasis on our, our social distancing, our frequent hand washing, our not bringing our hands to our face, or covering our face when we cough or sneeze. These, these things will continue. Another thing that will continue is, is the wearing of facial protection. And so I would really encourage all of you, uh, especially if you have to go out from your home for essential purposes, if you're around 
other people uh, to, to wear a mask. Uh, it's to protect yourself. It's to protect your, your family and loved ones. It's also to protect other individuals in the event that you may have been exposed to uh, COVID-19. So, uh, so I've seen a lot of creative masks as I have looked around. And uh, um, again, they're, they're not difficult to make. Uh, we certainly don't want to take away from the the N95s that are important uh, for our health care providers and, and other frontline workers. But I, I really strongly encourage all of you as Virginians to, to get a mask and to, to get comfortable with it because I, I think you're going to need to continue to wear it uh, in the upcoming months as we move forward. So thank you all again, and uh, we look forward to being with you on Friday.